for being with us here tonight. It's a pleasure to be um, sitting with all of you alongside Nico, um, despite the circumstances. Um, to start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians of the land, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people and the Woiwurrung people, and pay respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty never ceded, and this land always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And as a Palestinian, it's extremely important for me uh, and for us to keep highlighting um, all the forms and shapes in which settler colonialism continues to impact colonized people and colonized land. Um, my name is Zura, and um, we're meeting here today as we enter almost this, over two months of Israeli aggression and attacks on our people in Gaza. For the last two months, since October 7th, um, Israel has massacred over 18,000 Palestinians, 70% of whom are children and women. Um, targeting civilians and civilian infrastructure, including hospitals, schools, markets, libraries, you name it. No one is spared, no, one's, no, no one is safe, and no place is safe in Gaza. Um, sadly, Samah could not make it tonight um, for personal reasons. She is unwell, so she's a last minute apology. Um, but what we will do tonight is that we uh, will be in conversation with Nico. Um, I'll ask a few questions, and then towards the end, we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, when that stage comes, I would like to ask you to um, keep your questions short, concise, um, and um, just not because I don't like to listen to analysis and uh, you know essays and um, PhD dissertations, I do, but uh, just trying to make sure everyone gets to contribute and participate and to, so that we make it as engaging as possible for folks here. Um, right, so without any further ado, um, allow me to introduce our guest. Uh, Miko Pellet is an Israeli-American anti-Zionist peace activist, author, and karate instructor. <laughs> Black belt. Um, Miko is considered by many to be one of the clearest voices calling for justice for Palestine. Miko is also a contributor to several online publications and has been invited to speak all over the world. Wherever he's speaking, Miko dedicates the opportunity to advocate for the creation of one democratic state with equal rights for Israelis and Palestinians. He travels regularly to Palestine where he speaks and works with the BDS movement and other justice groups. So welcome and thank you, Nico, for being here tonight. So, Nico, the, the 7th of October has been categorized by many as a turning point, as a pivotal historical moment. Um, I guess my first question would be, what implications this day has for Israelis and Palestinians. Obviously, we know how it's been working for Palestinians, but more specifically, what implications does it have for the Israeli politics, and how would that also translate um, in terms of the Palestinians inside and outside uh, of, of Israel in 1948? Does this work? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you um, for the invitation to be here in Melbourne. It's a pleasure to be here once again after I was here in 2011. And it's good to see so many people gather uh, wanting to talk about Palestine. It's always very encouraging, especially when we're so many, so, so far away, in a place so distant, and still there's such a sincere desire to learn and to talk and to participate in the conversation about Palestine. But thank you for the introduction and um, for doing this with me. Um, October the 7th, for, for anyone who's involved on the issue of Palestine, October the 7th is one of those dates that 
we will always remember exactly where we were when we heard about this. And it was a watershed moment, there's no question. Now, what actually happened was a group of fighters from one of the poorest and most oppressed regions in the world flew in on gliders, came by sea on small vessels, and walked across the prison fence and were able to occupy almost half of Palestine. 22 Israeli cities and and settlements were taken by these fighters. Um, the military base of the Gaza Brigade, which was supposed to prevent that from ever happening, was taken. I've heard, although there's no confirmation, that the general, the commanding general, was taken. And basically, this group of fighters from, once again, I'll say, one of the poorest and most oppressed areas in the world, was able to completely paralyze the state of Israel. The Israeli military was nowhere to be found. The Israeli intelligence was nowhere to be found. Israelis were in a state of shock. This country that everybody hails as a great you know, miracle, a great democracy, a functioning country, was completely paralyzed by this group of, this, uh, this group of fighters. And it took the Israeli military, this you know, over-glamorized, terrorist organization, which is probably, like I said before, one of the best equipped and best financed terrorist organizations in the world. It took them weeks before they were able to take the fighting back into the Gaza Strip. And as we know, they're still fighting and suffering heavy casualties. And I think it's important to remember that Palestinians have never had an army. Palestinians have never had a military force. There's never been a Palestinian tank or a warplane, much less. So, this was unprecedented. On top of that, I don't think it's, it's a, um, I don't think it was a, um, uh, by chance that this happened exactly 50 years and one day after the 1973 attack which started the 1973 October War. And, um, once again, we saw, and again, this is not the first time, once again we saw that the Israeli military is basically a paper tiger. Whenever it's challenged, it falls apart. The Israeli intelligence apparatus, which everybody admires as a great intelligence apparatus, failed miserably. And then what happened was the state of Israel and the Israeli army, which were so severely humiliated, embarked on a massive campaign of vengeance like a bully or a gangster that is humiliated, they found the weakest, most defenseless people on earth to take out their revenge. And you said some 18,000, what I heard is the, the, um, the conservative, conservative estimate for the numbers, number of Palestinian civilians who have been brutally murdered over these last couple of months exceeds 20,000, and that's a conservative estimate. People are expecting that once all the missing will be found, and all the people who are buried under the rubble, having died these horrific deaths, it'll exceed 50,000. So this is unprecedented, even for the cruelty and brutality of Israel, this is unprecedented. And what we've seen is, and a lot of unprecedented things, I'm gonna be using this word a lot, incredible courage by the Palestinians, incredible capabilities by the Palestinians, and it's interesting because in the first few days, even Israeli generals were praising the Palestinian ability, the Palestinians' ability to do what they did. And again, we have to remember, we're not talking about soldiers. We're talking about people that, if they get one meal a day, that's good. They don't have supply lines like an army would, certainly not like Israel has. And so this, this was really quite a remarkable achievement. And then, of course, we see Israel's response, this, this brutal savagery, um, which has been un unprecedented even for Israel. Now, um, like I said, this, this, this was a watershed moment, and I think it presented, and still perhaps presents, a unique opportunity. 
something we have never seen before. And that opportunity is for the international community to demand, in no uncertain terms, guarantees for the safety and security of the Palestinian people. Palestinians, like, uh, like you, you said uh, correctly, have no place that they're safe. There's no place in Palestine where Palestinians are safe. This is not new. Palestinians have been living under a reign of terror for 75 years. Uh, bombs and destruction have been, have been raining on people who live in the Gaza Strip for decades. This is nothing new. But the level is unprecedented. So this is an opportunity for the international community to step in and say, enough. Palestinians have paid a high, a way above what it should be considered a, a high enough uh, price. And it's time to demand everything that Palestinians deserve. Safety and security must be guaranteed. Money must be, must be coming in in order to help them rebuild and, and, and rehabilitate. Massive sanctions must be imposed on the state of Israel. A no-fly zone must be imposed over Gaza. And the apartheid regime, steps must be taken to begin the dismantling of the apartheid state and replacing it with a free democratic Palestine with equal rights. This is the time to do this. This is the time, I mean, the time to do this was a long time ago, before these 20, 30, 40,000 innocent men, women, and children were murdered. But now, this is not a time to negotiate. This is not a time to ask. This is a time to demand. This is a time to stand up in a way and make demands in no uncertain terms. Palestinian freedom, the dismantlement of apartheid, and <laughs> rebuilding as much as possible and giving Palestinians everything they need in order to uh, recuperate from this, from, from this you know, catastrophe. So I believe that even now, and another interesting thing is of course that even as the bodies are piling up by the tens of thousands We've been used to seeing thousands murdered in, in Gaza in previous attacks by Israel. But we're talking about tens of thousands now. And as the bodies continue to pile up, the Israeli army has still not been able to defeat the Palestinian fighters and they're, and they're, and they're, um, and they're having massive losses. Massive losses. Officers, all their special forces and all their glamorized uh, you know, little terror squads are being, are being, are being um, are being killed by the Palestinians, who, again, I will say, are not an actually regular army, do not have the supply lines, the logistics, the resources that an army has. And so this should give every single person a moment to, 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 to pause and say, we have to make sure whatever is demanded now, whatever is demanded now has to include the absolute guarantee that this will never happen again that no Palestinian will ever be in danger like this again. And this, of course, falls on us. So that's, that's what I believe October the 7th is all about. Thanks for that, Nicole. Uh, so yesterday, we, we saw the United Nations pass a motion for a ceasefire by a vast majority. Obviously, of those countries who opposed are Israel and the United States. Um, yet, we hear from Israeli officials that they will continue until they achieve their objectives. Um, the, objective, the objectives uh, of this um, you know, onslaught have been twofold, at least you know, according to the ones that have been declared by Israeli officials. First one is you know, returning of the hostages, and then the second one is elimination or extermination of Hamas. Um, I guess, what, what would that mean? What, what would that look like in terms of returning of hostages, but also eliminating Hamas. And how has it been, you know, you touched on it briefly, um, that on, on the ground, it's not really going well for the Israeli soldiers um, as they are faced with fierce resistance from um, um, these, you know, armed groups. Uh, but I guess what, what would that mean in terms of a timeline? But also, what is eliminating Hamas? Well, I don't believe that Israel has an objective. The only objective Israel has is vengeance. 
And, inter and, and this actually is, is, is working very well within internal Israeli politics because this is exactly what Israelis have been demanding for a very long time. So the, government's, uh, the government is doing exactly what their constituents want them to do. And so there's no, and since there's, I don't believe there's any objective, really, not a military or political objective to Israel. It's vengeance and, you know, desire to kill as many as possible. Um, if they want to eliminate Hamas, if they want to eliminate Palestinian resistance, you know, I think there's a very clear pathway to doing that. Uh, that would include, like I said, um, dismantling the apartheid state, um, allowing Palestinians to return to their homes, and as the beginning the you know to the, to the transition from apartheid to a free democratic Palestine with equal rights. This is how resistance is, is stops by ending the oppression, ending the occupation, and ending the killing. If anybody, I don't believe anybody thinks this seriously, although they claim it. But it's ridiculous to expect that a military operation could possibly bring down a, a, the Palestinian resistance. It's not going to happen. I don't believe anybody believes it's going to happen, but again, they have to say this, and because the Israeli government's constituents are you know, demanding it, the fighting and the fighting and the fighting and the killing uh, will continue. So I think the pathway to ending the fighting is very clear, it's just that Israel does not want that. And the international community, for reasons that we can touch on later perhaps, the international community is completely, completely um, has forsaken the Palestinians. They're allowing Israel to continue with this, with this, with this unbelievable brutality, um, and they're saying, and you know, the United States is sending them more weapons. As far as the United Nations, Israel never cared about the United Nations, and there's no, there's no reason for Israel to care about the United Nations today. The United Nations has no means of, um, you know, enforcement. Now, if the United States and the international community wanted to stop. The United States has, the United States Navy's Sixth Fleet is in the Mediterranean. They can bring these warships to force Israel to stop. They can bring these, uh, the Sixth Fleet, and start helping people in Gaza. They can enforce the uh, no-fly zone and, and severe sanctions. They can do this tomorrow if they're serious about this. Uh, but they're not serious about this, and that's why um, they're passing, you know, they're passing in one resolution after another, or they're, they're vetoed, they're not vetoed. It makes absolutely no sense, no, no difference because they're not enforcing it. And again, Israel never cared about what the UN did or didn't do. So this is, this is, you know, this is so far below what is required. Um, and the ongoing talk of a ceasefire is a joke because Israel has, doesn't have to stop, and Israel has always violated ceasefires. Um, what is required is a much, much greater effort to end the violence against Palestinians. Um, thanks for that. I think, um, so, yes, obviously genocide is, um, is the strategy, but it's also the goal. So there is no clear objective aside than eliminating the um, indigenous population of Gaza, obviously, the, the over two million Palestinian people. And that is that. Obviously, that's not a, a, a in, a, in by itself. It's not a, a new development. It's a part of an ongoing policies and strategies, and that we've seen for the last, you know, at least 17 years in Gaza, in Gaza but also um, over 75 years in Palestine, across the historic Palestine. Um, I guess maybe we could talk a little bit more about the the United Nations, the international community, and we saw what the international community can do if it's serious about. Um, um, accountability in the case of Ukraine. Like, everyone knew exactly what to do. People withdrew their um, officials. Um, there were sanctions imposed. Again, um, you mentioned no fly zone on, on Gaza, but how is it, how likely for that to actually occur? And what kind of pressure um, uh, do maybe, um, I guess, actors uh, on the international level, but also maybe civil society organizations like people, you know, like us? Um, what is it that we need to do to help bring that uh, closer to reality and you know to achieve that kind of um, um, yeah. Well, I think we have to recognize that the Palestinians and the entire Palestinian issue are orphans. There's nobody taking care of the Palestinians, and nobody stands for Palestinians. There's no state. There's no group of states. There's no international organization. Nobody is protecting the Palestinians. Nobody speaks for the Palestinians. You know, if you compare it, for example, to the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, you had the ANC, which was a formidable organization, you had the South African Communist Party, you had the Soviet bloc, 
you had Cuba sending tanks uh, to Angola to, to, to defeat the apartheid state and so on. So I mean, the, 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 the black South Africans had allies. Palestinians had nothing. And probably one of Israel's biggest achievements is the, and, and biggest successes is the Oslo Accords. Because the Oslo Accord neutralized the, the, the countries that supported Palestinians, uh, or the Palestinian cause. And so when people said, oh, Oslo failed, Oslo didn't fail, Oslo was a, a spectacular success for Israel. And I believe that what we're seeing today is a direct result of that. Um, but we need to recognize our weakness before we can do anything. And when we look at the other side, the Zionists have had a very well uh, financed uh, strategic plan to do what they're doing. So they've been doing this for over 100 years, long before the state of Israel was established. And there's never been, there's never been a counter. There's never been anything even remotely similar to what the, the Zionists have been doing. And of course, when Israel was established, the Israeli, the, the state of Israel has been doing, in terms of PR, in terms of presenting their case. So if you are, an American politician, an Australian politician, and you want to make an informed decision, you don't have the tools to do that. Because one side presents a very compelling story, a very compelling case, and they push this case forward very, very, very strongly, very aggressively. And on the other side, there are some activists doing a little bit of work here and there, and we can, nobody can compete. And so I, I don't think that we can make a difference until such time that, we, that something like this is created. You know, we live in democracies where we vote for our elected officials. Well, why are we voting for elected officials who support Israel? And how do we use the power that we have in the ballot box and as consumers of the press in, in bringing about that change? That is, the big, that is the, the big question. And without a clear strategy, without a real playbook that helps people deal with this, and you know, people always ask, well, how do I respond when they say this? And how do I respond when they say that? Because they're very good at putting people on, on, people on our side on the defensive. Do you condemn this? Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? You know, that's not how you, how you conduct the conversation. They push bumper stickers, they push slogans, and then they expect us to somehow respond. So it takes training, it takes time, it takes somebody to do this, and there's nobody doing it. And there's nobody doing it because, again, there's no parent for the Palestinian for Palestinians, and there's no parent for the Palestinian cause. And that is a very, very serious problem. Um, you know, uh, I've been talking to some friends here about uh, initiatives I'm involved in in Washington, D.C., putting together precisely some, that kind of an organization, that kind of Palestinian presence in Washington, D.C., which is where, at the end of the day, things need to change so that things change everywhere else. Um, but we need to recognize this weakness and we have to work within that. I don't know that we have the capability right now to actually do anything other than get together and speak and so on. We don't really have, uh, uh, the, the, there's a huge gap between public opinion and what happens in the halls of power. And it's true here and it's true in Europe and it's true uh, in the United States, it's true everywhere. Uh, and the same goes for the press. You know, there's no representation in the press for the massive support that Palestinians have, you know, and on the street and in, in places around the world, including here. And that is a serious problem. So I think once we recognize that and we start working towards that, then we will begin to see change. But it is a massive, a massive, massively difficult um, project, a massively difficult uh, thing that we need to do. I think you touched on a really important point, the fact that there's um, the lack of political or proper political representation for the Palestinians is, is an issue. Um, but also on the other side, you mentioned that you know this, this, um, the last couple of months have presented an opportunity. Um, and I think and I think this is something um, that is quite interesting because, when, when we talk about Palestine, um, recently we're hearing a lot about you know, the resurrection of the two-state solution discourse by, by officials. Um, it's coming, coming back really strongly. I mean, you know, the Australian government has always held that position that you know, it's, it's like a talking point, right? Blah, 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 and then two-state solution. No one really knows what that means. Uh, no one knows what that would look like. If, if that's even, you know, a viable, no, but that's not a concern. No one's really actually interested in implementing any two-state solution or any solution for the Palestinians. 
Um, so I would say, like, what, why would you think, um, why is it that it's back in, in this kind of intensity at this stage, specifically in the last couple of months, since, you know, post-October 7th, suddenly everyone wants a two-state solution? Uh, and you also mentioned Oslo and how it's actually been a success for um, Israel, um, and obviously two-state solution is also tied. Yeah, well, the two-state solution is what people say when they don't want to tell the truth. And so they fall back on the two-state solution knowing that it's very safe because it's never going to happen. Uh, I frankly really don't know what the virtues of the two-state solution are, and I don't, I don't understand why the two-state solution is a good solution. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of a story. Some of you, you know, know, know I've written my book, The General Sun, Journey of Israel and Palestine. And in the book, I talk about several things that have to do with my father, who was the general. And I'll tell you two episodes, from, two, two things um, that are in the book that have to do with my father. He was a young uh, lieutenant colonel in the 1950s. Um, he spoke in front of an audience of uh, wealthy Jewish donors and, uh, and important members of the Israeli cabinet. And he said, and this is mentioned in, in, in the memoirs of Israel's uh, prime minister at the time, and he said that uh, the Israeli army is prepared and ready for the order to push the eastern boundaries of the state of Israel to their natural place, which is the Jordan River. This is the mid early 1950s. In other words, to take the West Bank. So he said, we're ready, we're expecting this, we know that these are the natural boundaries of our state, and we're just waiting for the, you know, the governments to give us the order. Well, 1967, they actually did it without the order, but that's another story. The Israeli army took the West Bank and pushed the Israeli boundaries to where they thought it should be, and they called it finishing the job because they believed that in 1948, um, they should have taken more, but then for whatever reasons they didn't. So then they created these two areas, one called West Bank, one called Gaza Strip, which Israelis drew, by the way. Israelis drew them. And today, we're, they're treated like they are, like they've been there forever. On the last day of the 1967 war, and again, I, calling it a war, I think is a bit of a, um, I, I, I don't think it's the right way to, to describe what happened in 1967. It was a brutal assault by Israel against its neighbors for the sake of taking land. And it wasn't a six-day war, it was actually a five-day war. And why was it called the Six Day War? Anybody want to guess? The Six Days of Creation was a miracle. And in the Israeli prayer book, Six Days, if you look at the Israeli prayer book, the term Six Days, Six Days, Six Days shows up a lot as the miracle of creation. They wanted to tie what happened in 1967 to the Six Days of Creation as though it was a miracle. And even to this day, even to this day, people who don't believe in God or in miracles say that that was a miracle. <laughs> and why, I'm really not sure. There was no miracle. It was a brutal assault by a very well-trained, well-prepared army against Israel, the neighbors of the state of, of, of Israel. And um, I don't know if you know this, this is a kind of a side, but, you know, at the end of those five days, the Arab armies suffered 18,000 casualties. 18,000 Arab soldiers were killed. Israel suffered 700 casualties. So I think the difference shows. Now every, you know, we, everybody that dies has a mother and a father, and we, you know, we hope that nobody has this to go through that as a parent, but that just to show the, what actually took place. But anyway, on the fifth day, of the, or the last day of the war, the Israeli military high command met, and my father, of course, was still in uniform. He was one of the generals who planned and, and executed that assault. But he stood up and he said something very interesting. He stood up and he said, and I know some of you know this because you read the book, but he stood up and he said, we now have an opportunity to make peace with our neighbors. We can allow the Palestinians to establish a state in the West Bank and Gaza, the newly occupied territories. We can return the Sinai to the Egyptians, the Golan Heights to the Syrians. We can make peace with all of our neighbors and move on. Because now the accomplishments of 1948 are secure. And we can have a Jewish state. There will be a little Palestinian state so Palestinians can enjoy their own right to self-determination, and we can move on. And two things happened while he was saying this. The 
first one is Israeli bulldozers who were destroying neighborhoods in East Jerusalem that had just been taken, destroying villages and towns in the newly acquired territories in the West Bank, uh, um, forcing into exile hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from those areas, and building, massively building, for Jews only in those territories. This happened immediately as his words were being said, you know, as the war ended. The other thing that happened is that his comrades in arms, you know, Sakhar Bean and all these generals who were involved in that, took him aside and said, what in the world, what the hell are you talking about? What the hell are you talking about? We just finished the job of 1948, now you're telling us that you want to give it back? And you know, it didn't make any sense. Now he retired from the military about a year later and his, the rest of his life he spent promoting this idea of the two-state solution which became less and less and less and less possible because the state of Israel wanted to make sure that that would never happen. <laughs> to the point where there is no West Bank. West Bank is just, a, you know, still in our imagination and in some old maps, but there's no West Bank. It's completely integrated into Israel. You may have heard they're called, that area is now called Judea and Samaria. And the one distinction that exists in those areas is the way Israel, <coughs> excuse me, the way Israel describes it. There are pockets of alien population. Pockets of alien population. Pockets, three and a half million people living in ghettos. And they are the alien population, not the settlers. Not the Israeli settlers. The Palestinians are the alien population. So when people ask me today about the two-state solution, I do exactly what you said. Well, tell me how it's going to work. And that's when they take out the rope, they wrap it around their neck, and they hang themselves because there's no way to explain it. And there are no virtues to the two-state solution anyway. What are the virtues of a two-state solution? And why should the Palestinians accept the smaller part? Maybe Israel should, the state of it, the Jewish state should be in the West Bank and Gaza, and the rest of Palestine should be for Palestinians. Who said that this should be, the, that this is somehow a correct division? Why should Palestinians agree to this absurd so-called solution? It's absurd. And today they say, oh, the problem with Hamas is they don't accept the two-state solution. The problem with this person, he doesn't accept the two-state solution. The problem is the Palestinians don't accept it. Not that Israel made it impossible. The problem is that the Palestinians don't accept it. It's no longer there. It existed as a possibility for maybe five minutes historically. And Israel made sure. Now, Israel established a single state from the river to the sea with privilege only for Israeli Jews. Who are the minority of the population between the river and the sea? Is it allowed to say river and the sea, by the way? Yes. yes. So Israel, Israel, Israel established a single state, an apartheid state, a violent, brutal apartheid regime from the river to the sea for the minority Jewish population of settlers. When Palestinians call for a free democratic Palestine with equal rights from the river to the sea, that's the problem. Why does this make sense? Why, why do people even accept this? When Palestinians say it, it's hate speech. When Israelis are calling for apartheid, racism, and violence by the minority, <coughs> that's somehow okay. That's somehow, you know, acceptable. So again, it's one of these, it's, but you know, Certainly, I'm sure the Australian government and other Western governments, and even beyond the West, you know, the BRICS countries are not much better than that. The Africans are not much better than that. They all talk about the two-state solution because they don't want to make a choice. You have to make a choice. Apartheid or freedom and democracy. But when you make that choice, it's very clear that the state of Israel, which is the name that was given to the apartheid state that, that took over Palestine, must be dismantled and that a free democratic Palestine is the only way, the only path that can lead to a peace between Israelis and Palestinians. <laughs> Nobody wants to say that. But this is precisely what needs to be said. And this is precisely, I believe, the way this needs to be framed. It's not Israelis versus the Palestinians because one solution will lead to peace and to, uh, you know, and to the benefit of both Israelis and Palestinians. And the other solution is a racist, violent solution. It's not about Israelis versus Palestinians. It's about racism and violence, 
versus uh, freedom and democracy. And that's how it should be framed. So why they fall back on a two-state solution? Because it's easy. And it's the only thing they're willing to talk about. And even that is considered extreme today. Um, sense that it's anti-two-state solution, um, as well as we've, you know, we've um, continuously heard um, comments from Israeli politicians that, especially the ones who are currently in, in power, that they, obviously there will never be a, a state, a Palestinian state, alongside a Jewish state. Um, but then recently we also heard two days ago, Benny Netanyahu kind of um, insinuating or saying, actually not insinuating, just clearly saying that uh, Israel is ready for uh, a war against Palestinian Authority uh, as well. Uh, so how how does that all play in 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 the kind of broader picture of what is, what, what what is Netanyahu's strategy? Um, and obviously Netanyahu, um, as you know, uh, it's quite known for everyone is a struggling in terms of domestic politics, but also with all the corruption allegations that um, could land him in prison. Um, but how is opening another front, which I mean, it's currently ongoing as well, and that's where I guess I want to kind of also maybe uh, direct the discussion a little bit um, around what's happening in the West Bank and in Jenin. Um, and what does, what would that look like for Netanyahu to kind of also wage war on the Palestinian Authority or, you know, Palestinian forces? Benjamin Netanyahu has only one strategy. He has only one objective, and that's to keep his backside in the chair. That's it. He will do anything to keep his backside in the Prime Minister's chair. That's the only strategy, that's the only objective he has, and he will do anything he needs to do to do that. And to be quite honest, he's done a very good job. I think his, his, his backside is perfectly safe. Um, Israeli public opinion it's very easy to, you know, I mean, if people want to know what Israelis think, just look at, the, look at the makeup of the Israeli Knesset, of the Israeli parliament. That's what Israelis think. Look at the makeup of the Israeli uh, uh, cabinet, the Israeli government. That's what Israelis think. Israelis voted for them over and over and over again many, many times. So it's very obvious what Israelis want. And whenever there is Palestinian bloodshed, Israelis seem to be perfectly happy. And they have full, and they give their full throughout support to the, to the government. You know, you remember, I'm sure, that a few months ago, or until a few months ago, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of, thousands of Israelis were in the streets protesting against Netanyahu. They didn't go anywhere because they were, they were all the people that didn't vote for him, and he has a secure majority in the Knesset, so it didn't matter. But there was something very interesting that happened at one point, uh, and it had to do with the Israeli Air Force pilots. So Israeli Air Force pilots have to maintain, the reservists have to maintain their training, weekly training. It's a very rigorous regimen. They have to be very well trained because they might be called on you know, very quickly to drop millions of tons of bombs on a defenseless population in Gaza or to bomb uh, targets in Syria and so on. So they have to prepare and they're happy and willing to do that. When the protests against Netanyahu were taking place, several Air Force pilots said they will not go for the training because they are going to the protests. And democracy is more important than even the training. Where are they now? Where, where are they now? Israeli Air Force pilots are considered in Israeli society to be the gods, the cream of the crop. Everybody adores them. And they adore themselves. <laughs> Where are they now? They have no problem whatsoever. They have no problem whatsoever. You haven't seen, I haven't heard any of them say, no, 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 we're not going to do this. They're lining up. So, there is no clear objective other than maintaining the violence. And Israel made it very, very clear very early on, in the 1950s, that peace is not an objective. It's never been an objective. The only objective is always making sure that they are the best armed bully in the neighborhood. That's
That's it. And that they kill more Arabs than Arabs can kill of them. That's it. And to that end, they, you have to say they've done a very good job. But this continues to be the case. This continues to be the case. That has never changed. I don't think this particular government is any more extreme than any other government that Israel has had. I mean, Israel's first government conducted the ethnic cleansing in 1948. How much more extreme could these people be? You know, so there, I don't believe that there's been any shifts whatsoever. It's been a continuous, persistent, um, uh, you know, moving forward uh, with the same objective. So, killing Palestinians, you know, terrorizing countries around uh, uh, around Palestine is what Israel does, and they do it all the time. And um, of course, the, that's why I said earlier the most important thing to do now. And again, we're late, we're about 20,000 innocent civilians late, is to make sure there's pressure to, to guarantee the safety and the lives of Palestinians. The security and the safety and the lives of Palestinians must be the absolute first objective. And a ceasefire is not going to do it. A demand for a ceasefire is not going to guarantee anything. Not even a, what do they say, a long-standing ceasefire or a permanent... There's no such thing as a permanent ceasefire. We're dealing with Israel. There's no such thing as a permanent ceasefire. The only permanent ceasefire will be when Israel is dismantled and replaced with a real democracy with equal rights. That has to be the objective. So, so it's really important not to be kind of, you know, pulled into this confusion of Israeli politics, the confusion of the kind of the rhetoric and the, uh, about what is happening right now. Are they going to bring somebody else to take care of uh, Gaza? Will Hamas be destroyed? Will the PA be this? That? That's not what's important right now. It's important not to be pulled into that conversation, but be absolutely clear that the one demand that has to be consistent is the safety and security of Palestinians, period, long term and forever. This must never be allowed to happen again, ever. And the only way to do that is, like I said, every sanctions and so on to dismantle the apartheid state. That's it. Don't talk about anything, any of the ceasefire, two-state solution, peace with Israel. There's no such thing. There is no such thing. The welfare of Palestinian children from the river to the sea and beyond, and the refugees in camps outside of Palestine, must be our first objective. Their safety. Nothing is more important than that. Nothing should, be, nothing should get in the way of that conversation. Nothing should, you know, uh, uh, distract us from that. There should be no distractions allowed. The safety of Palestinian children, of Palestinian men and women, and the elderly, and so on, must be the only objective. And to that end, we have to make the, 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 the toughest demands possible, the biggest demands possible. And then we can see a movement forward. What happens is really politics isn't enough, not to tell you who cares. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Palestinians have always experienced uh, Israel as an expansionist and exclusionist project, in the sense that it cannot live with others who are non Zionists. Uh, but specifically, clearly, we're, you know, we're talking about Palestinians. Um, so it, it has been uh, consistent in that sense with all of its policies and practices and all of its operations um, to, uh, to kind of uh, achieve that goal. Um, but also at the same time, we've also seen consistency from the Palestinians in the sense that um, relentless, you know, smooth and the way that the Palestinians have been able to kind of continuously evolve and reshape the, the, the struggle, but also the resistance, has always uh, has also been something um, that it, Israel, you know, clearly, 75 years later, has it's unable to complete its project. So we know that the Zionist project is not, is not complete, and that is because of the sumut of the, the Palestinian people. So I think I just wanted to make that point um, that. Yes, we know what we're up against, and we know that it's not just Israel, and we know it's the U.S. and the U.K. Um, and all of the, you know, in terms of the political level globally, um, we know the enormity of, you know, the quote unquote the enemy um, in this in the in this instance. But we also know that we have been the main block um, on the ground uh, in terms of. 
um, allowing Israel to achieve its full objective when it comes to Zionism. So, um, what, what, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the reality is that out of about what, 12 million people who live between the river and the sea, um, about 7 million are Palestinians. So, Palestinians are the majority of the population. And the vast and Palestinians have been resisting in a, in, in, in a variety of very you know, uh, you know, creative ways, mostly unarmed, by the way. And so I think that's, I mean, there's no way, certainly, that, that you know, Palestinians deserve to be commended for this, and they've shown an in, amazing, incredible ability um, to sacrifice and incredible you know, creativity in, their, in, their, in the ways in which they um, resist. But I think they've paid enough. I think Palestinians have paid a heavy price that is far beyond what any nation should have to pay. And so I think, again, it's up to, it's up to us to stand up and, and make sure that they don't have to pay anymore. You know, and we're not just talking about Gaza. Palestinians have been living a life of terror for 75 years. There's this impression that somehow the Palestinians of 1948, who have this dubious distinction of having Israeli citizenship are somehow exempt from this. And you know, if I may, I'll, I'll say a word or two about that. People don't realize the citizenship that Palestinians have, those that have citizenship, is nothing like the citizenship that Israelis have, Israeli Jews have. Nothing like it whatsoever. Um, and I'll give you just a couple examples, if I may. So for example, the Palestinians of 1948 are governed by different agencies. The entire southern part of the country, it's called the Nakab, that's 50%, this is the southern half of Palestine, is governed by an agency called the Agency for the Development of the Negev. They call it the Negev. The Nakab is Negev in Hebrew. When Israel has an agency that says the development, that means getting rid of Palestinians. That means destroying Palestinian homes, destroying Palestinian lives, and stealing Palestinian land. That's what the word development means. They have the development of the Galilee, the development of Jerusalem, the, of course, the development. So the Palestinians are enough of some 300,000 Palestinian Bedouin. It's not a small number. Who mostly live without access to water or electricity or roads or medical care or jobs or education. Although some miraculously, with all of these uh, obstacles, manage to make it to university, manage to, you know, to, to, um, to achieve incredible, incredible accomplishments. But by and large, this is where they live. And again, the, that agency has its own uh, law enforcement, which is not, again, it's not law enforcement, it's destruction of homes and stealing of Palestinian land. Now, the Nakab, even though it's a desert, it's a very fertile desert, which is why the Israeli settlements there enjoy some of the highest standard of living among Israelis. And agriculture is very successful there. Now, the Palestinian Bedouin and the Nakab were traditionally farmers but they're not allowed to engage in farming. Only Israelis, Israelis are allowed, Israeli Jews, are allowed to engage in uh, cultivating the land in the Nakba. If I went back tomorrow, I could have a ranch subsidized. All the land I want, access to water, I could grow anything I want. Palestinian, the Palestinian Bedouins whose land this is, are not allowed to engage in agriculture. And this is what this is. This was their tradition. And you know, they talk about Israel having made the desert bloom, particularly when they talk about the Nakba. If you look at aerial photos taken by the British when they occupied Palestine, you will see tracts of cultivated land in the Nakba, cultivated by the Palestinian Bedouin. So it's nonsense. They didn't make anything bloom. They stole a country that was in full bloom. Just to make that clear. And I'll just say this. I know that Francesca Albanese was here. Recently, she's a good friend, she's you know, a wonderful person, of course, and she wrote an co-authored an incredibly important document a few years ago, and it's titled uh, Palestinian Refugees in International Law. It's a very, you know, it's a very academic uh, uh, book, but it's really very, very important to read. I wrote a, a review, a pretty long review a few years ago when, when it came out, and one of the things she details in that book 
is what was stolen from Palestinians. And I'll, I'm just going to say this. I know it's not exactly answering your question, but I think it's important. So we know the Palestinians' homes were stolen, land was stolen. But what, she, what this book also mentions is things that people don't think about. Entire cities were stolen. Entire cities were already there that Israel stole. Yaffa and Haifa and Akka and, and Tabaria and on and on and on and on and on. Jerusalem, of course, Eskelan, and on and on and on. Cities, entire cities. So, you know, public spaces were taken. People had money in the bank. That was taken. Whatever, you know, vehicles, agricultural um, uh, equipment, the produce. Palestine was exporting citrus, Jaffa oranges. Barley from the Nakhab, cotton, olive oil, soap, and on and on and on. It was, a, it, was, it was a thriving economy, a thriving culture, a thriving country. It was all stolen, which is one of the reasons Israel was able to function as a state very quickly after it was established. All of this was stolen. They didn't make anything bloom. They stole a country in full bloom. And then they said that they made it bloom. So I think it's important to put that in context. So again, going back to the Palestinians, the citizens of Israel, they're the ones who ended up remaining in that part of the country, which is known today as Palestine in 1948. So it's Palestine without the West Bank and Gaza. And so again, half the country is, uh, is governed by this other agency. And, and, and I'll, let me give you some numbers in terms of home demolition, for example. Over the last five years, there have been between 10 and 12,000 homes in the Nakhab alone demolished. Now, there are many Israeli communities in Nakhab. Like I said, they enjoy some of the highest standard of living. How many of those homes, how many of those homes would you imagine were the homes of Israeli Jews that built illegally or without a permit? Anybody want to guess? Yeah. None. Now, does that mean Israelis never built without a permit? No. I know Israelis that built a permit, they had a balcony and they made it into a, into a room. If, if an inspector finds out that this happens, the authorities find out, they send an inspector, he writes a report, maybe there's a fine, so then they go to court, the court takes years and years and years, maybe they have to, you know, pay a larger fine, whatever. You never ever ever see the Israeli military or the Israeli police close down a street and demolish the home of an Israeli Jew, ever. Between 2,000 and 2,500 homes demolished in the Nakam alone. 40,000, 40,000 home demolition orders in the rest of the country, not including Jerusalem or the West Bank. And many Palestinian friends of mine who have home demolition orders will say, tell me, <coughs> It's almost worse to have the demolition order than having your home demolished because you don't know when they're going to come and do it. They might come tonight at 2 o'clock in the morning and destroy your home. You never know. A, good, a very good friend of mine, a wonderful activist from the city of Lid, maybe you know her, Fidesz Hade. She's a member of the Lid City Council. She grew up in this, in this environment and decided to study city planning because she realized there is no planning for the Palestinian cities in time, inside 1948, and in what's known as the mixed cities, like Akka, like Lid, and the others, where you have Jewish Israelis and Palestinians, the only planning is for the Israeli, Israeli uh, neighborhoods. Nothing for the Palestinians. Nothing. So she went to, God bless her, you know, she's a wonderful, brave woman. So she went and studied and now she's, you know, she's trying to make, you know, bring about change and she's a thorn in their side. But, you know, this is the lot and the lives of Palestinians in 1948, and correct me if I'm wrong, is governed by the Israeli intelligence services, by the Shabak. They can't take a step, they can't get a job. No one can become a teacher or a principal of a school without an okay from the Shabak. You know, the Israeli Ministry of Education has a security department. Israeli teachers don't have to go to the, that security department. Do you know what the security department is for? <laughs> for the Palestinian citizens of Israel who want to become a teacher. And I'll say one more thing about this. I can talk about it all day, but I'll say one more thing. You know that Israel passed a law where public institutions are not allowed to recognize the Nakba. 
And in one particular school, and I heard this from a principal in, in Jerusalem, a teacher wore a kofiyah on May 15th, which is not the day, wore a kofiyah to school. The next day, the principal received a call from the security department inside the Ministry of Education telling him that that teacher needs to be reprimanded the next day. So of course he had to call all the teachers and reprimand all the teachers and so on and so forth. This is the citizens of Israel, the Palestinians who have the citizenship of Israel. This will never happen to an Israeli, uh, an Israeli Jew. So this is the reality. You know, why is it apartheid? This is apartheid. You know, people ask, no, it's not apartheid, it's a democracy. The stories can go on and on and on how it's not. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I love talking about 1948, obviously, as a 1948er. Um, but just to that point, um, in which how, you know, Amnesty International put together a brilliant report that details all the ways in which Israel practices the crime of apartheid against all Palestinians, not only the ones in Gaza and Gaza Sea and the West Bank, but also in 1948, as well as the ones in the diaspora. Um, but I think, Miko, now to the, you know, the question of this. <laughs> no, these are not the question. But um, so, you know, when people found out that you're coming, I've had many friends um, sending me texts and reaching out, like, well, you have to ask him this question, including like my cousins in Germany and Denmark. Please ask him this question. So people want to know, Miko, um, so you were born in Jerusalem, you grew up in Mutzayit. Um, um, your grandfather signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence, and your father was a general in the Six Day War in 1967. And here you are. What happened? <laughs> to um, extend that kind of journey that you went through onto others in, you know, in Israel. It's called, it's, called the sin, it's called the sins of our fathers, right? Um, it is possible. There's no question it's possible. I don't think I did anything that's, that's, uh, that's, in, in, that's impossible, not even remotely. It's absolutely possible. I would say it's not that easy. I grew up in. Easy, I didn't say easy, but possible. Not that And there are other examples here of people who've done that, who've taken that journey. But, um, um, well, the, the, the short answer to that is well, that's why there's a book called The General Sun. But I'll give, you, I'll give you an answer anyway. So, um, yes, I was, I was born in this, in this uh, very, very privileged, very uh, Zionist, patriotic family, as many Israelis are. But in my case, there were so many members of my family that were part of this generation that established the state of Israel, and then um, and then were part of the you know the, the the actual you know governing of the state of Israel in the first few decades, and of course my father the general, and so I grew up in this atmosphere where you know Zionism was like God and the state was everything. You know, I had a great uncle who was a president, and uh, you know, we would all gather at the, you know, at the, at the president's residence, uh, you know, every year, and the whole family came, and all these important people were part. You know, there's nothing beat the general because he comes with his uniform, and it's the coolest. But nothing beats that. But I mean, everybody around, and the state was like this thing that you sacrifice for, and you work for, and you, you know, it was just a big deal. It's kind of semi-fascist, really. But as a boy, you grow up and you think, wow. You know? And then there's a break. And the break doesn't come all at once. It's, it's gradual. And that's why, again, I said there's a book. The journey of, of an Israeli in Palestine is a long one, even though geographically it's a very short one. And um, the break in, in, in something that is so fundamental, I think sadly only happens as a result of something terrible. You need to be shaken up. You need to be shaken up so severely that it forces you to look at the very fundamentals of who you are and what you believe. 
and then question them. Which again, it's never easy, but in my case, it's, you know, the, you know, the foundation of Israel was so part of who I was and what my family was about that it was very, very difficult. In my case, this, 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 uh, this terrible tragedy was my 13-year-old my niece was killed in a suicide attack in 1997, so a very long time ago. And that's exactly, exactly the kind of horror that forces you to re-examine the foundations on which you stand and which make up who you are. This is exactly the kind of thing. And um, I'll say two things about it. Number one, when you, when you carry a small coffin of a child to its final resting place, it's an experience you know you should dedicate your life to make sure this never happens to anyone ever again. That's the kind of experience that is. You can't imagine the horror. And the other thing is, you know, we become so accustomed to talk about violence when we talk about it in Palestine that we say, oh yeah, there was suicide bombing, 10 people were killed, and then we move on to something else. And what I'd like to say is, let's pause for a minute, okay? This was a long time ago, and many, many, many thousands of Palestinian deaths ago. And many death, Israeli deaths as well. But let's pause for a minute. What actually happened? Three young men took their lives. Three young men decided to take their lives and take the lives of others in the process. Wow, what are we talking about? What kind of reality that Israel create that brought about this horror, something so terrible. This is horrifying. This is horrifying. And again, I think part of the problem is that we talk about it and we move on. I'm saying, no, 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 we're not going to move on. Let's talk about this. And the only way to talk about this is to be engaged. So my response or my reaction was, to find a way to be engaged. So I was living in the US at the time. I was you know, back home for the funeral and the whole thing, and then I went back and, what do you do? Everything's changed. You can't just go back to work like nothing happened. Like, what do you do? I lived in San Diego in Southern California. Nobody wants to talk about Palestine. <laughs> and much less talk about something like this. Because people don't know how to respond. They don't know how to react. I was extremely, extremely fortunate that eventually, and it took a couple of years, I was able to connect with the Palestinian community in Southern California, particularly in San Diego. And at that time, there were these, uh, it was very popular for dialogue groups. They were called living room, living room dialogue groups, Jewish Palestinian. And people would meet in each other's homes once a month and discuss. Not discuss the politics, not argue and so on, but everybody just tells their story. And that was the first time I met Palestinians. I was born and raised in Jerusalem. A lot of Palestinians in Jerusalem. I never met them, any of them. I was in the United States the first time I met Palestinians. And then you sit there and you hear these very fine people talk and they're telling you that night is day and day is night and that the world is flat. I mean, that's the extent of, of, the, of, the, of what they were telling me when I compared it to what I knew to be true. And I had to know it was true because my family was involved. So obviously what I knew was true. And they're telling me that, again, night is day and day is night. So it's a process, and you have to insert a lot of trust. And the reason I, was so for, I said I was so fortunate is because that community was generous and kind enough to allow me to make that very painful journey from where I was to where I am today. And I, I was compared to like a, a child learning to walk when they hold on to something and then they have to let go and walk to the next thing that they can hold on to. And for me, that was exactly it. I had to let go of what I absolutely knew to be true and was a big part of my identity. It was actually the, the biggest part of my identity. And then walk somewhere and find my identity somewhere else. And that understanding of who I was and how could everything I know to be true turn out to be not true and so on. And that was the process. And then, you know, I began to engage in Palestine itself. And I would go to Palestinian cities, first inside 1948, and then the West Bank, and engage with Palestinians more and more. And the journey is, uh, you know, once you go beyond a certain point, it's a point of no return. 
So then I had to make a choice. Do I remain, I suppose, loyal to this background that I have, or do I follow my values? Because if I follow my values, I have to reject Zionism, because Zionism is a racist ideology that brought about a great deal of violence and suffering to another people. So eventually that was the, that was the route that I chose. I couldn't but reject Zionism. I couldn't but reject that entire history because of because it's uh, you know the injustice and so on. So that was the journey, and that's how I ended up you know where I am today. Thanks, Nicole. from the audience is, you know, you lived obviously in Israel in Palestine 1948 and you lived in Japan yeah. for a while and then and you were based in the US. So my question is, what would be lessons learned for global movement for justice for Palestine that you would um, kind of say that the Australian movement can learn from? Maybe are there any lessons that we can take from Say, you know, and look, knowing that the context is different to the U.S., obviously um, uh, different history, but also both movement, movements are on different stages. But what would be a helpful lesson that we could potentially apply here um, in Australia? Well, I don't know that I know more about that than people sitting in this room. Um, and I don't think that the differences are that great between Europe and here in the United States. I don't think the differences are great. I think we're all facing the exact same challenges. And that is, like I said before, the people in the halls of power are not listening to us. And even though we consume the press, the press is not representing us at all. And that is our challenge. We need to close that gap between what we believe and what they do, and between what we do and what they um, and what they report. It's like we don't exist. And so that is a challenge that I see in every place I've ever been to. All over Europe, all over the United States, here for the second time, in New Zealand, I mean, anywhere I've been, this is the exact same challenge. Um, and people always, every country I go to, every city I go to, people say, this is the worst. The press here is absolutely the worst. The government here is absolutely Zionist. Well, it's everywhere. And we're all facing the exact same challenge. So I think that there's a lesson here, and I don't think I'm saying here anything that others, everybody else hasn't figured out already, and that is we have to work together, and we have to create a strategy, and then we have to fight for an absolute free Palestine, no compromises, 100%, from the river to the sea, a free democratic Palestine with equal rights, and we have to be very, 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 you know, very disciplined. That that is the message. Don't talk to me about two-state solution. Don't mention Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel. It's Palestine. It has to be free and democratic.
just apologise. It's, this is, it's, a, it's not a point, it's just a brief announcement. Oh, uh, what no. I do, the way I promote Palestine is I printed leaflets, and I think, I believe this leaflet will be Sorry, helpful to people. Sorry, we need questions, so, any announcements? But, but, but basically, what I'm just saying is just how I get the word out. And it's important, and I've tried the long Thank you. Thanks very much for that. So please come and see me if you think this will be useful. Sure, sure. Australia must act to stop Israel's mass murder of Gaza Palestinians. Thank you. Uh, and look here, you say we have to make demands and not negotiate. What is, uh, what would be the kinds of direct action that would make refusing to acquiesce to the demands too expensive? about um, what your thoughts would be for a very young um, anti-Zionist movement that we are seeing in the U.S. right now, uh, with you know Jewish, um, the Jewish, uh, Jewish people for peace. Um, my, I think, why is it easier for younger Jewish people in the U.S. right now to identify the policies of the Zionist ideologies um, compared to their parents? Um, would, um, sorry, I'm just nervous. Would um, <laughs> um, the generational trauma come into play um, um, between the different generations um, in terms of their loyalty to the Zionist um, ideology? Okay, that's great. Okay, great question. So uh, we'll let Biko answer and then move to the... <laughs> okay, the first question is great. Uh, they're all good questions, so thank you. But this first question is really important. You know, this whole idea that somehow Israel is needed for U.S. interests or Western interests in the Middle East, that sort of thing, you know, I, I don't think it's true. I mean, let's say tomorrow Palestine was free and democratic. Why would they not be working with the U.S. or you know? I mean, uh, you know, the U.S. has great allies, great you know, has, has allies in Egypt, in Jordan, in Saudi Arabia, in the Gulf, in most of North Africa. Why does it need Israel in particular? You know, if Palestine was free and democratic, I'm sure they'd still be happy to receive four billion dollars a year. <laughs> uh, hopefully, they won't, hopefully, they won't, hopefully, they won't use it to buy arms. They'd use it to do something productive. But I mean, I, I think it's nonsense. I think it's absolute nonsense. And I'm glad you asked the question because I, I think you see that too. Um, but nah, it's a ridiculous claim. It's, just, it's a part of this Zionist propaganda that somehow the world needs Israel because Israel is this wonderful, miraculous thing. But it's absolute nonsense. I, I agree with you. I don't think it's, I don't think it's needed at all. Um, but what, what, you know, I, I, to talk about how to make basically the occupation of Palestine costly is I think what you're asking. And I have a great friend who's a remarkable hero. His name is Isa Amro. And he operates in Al Khalil, in the city of Hebron. He runs what is probably the most important and most effective grassroots resistance organization in Palestine. And he himself is an icon. I respect him greatly. I follow him into fire. And um, he always says, we have to make it costly. We have to make it costly. Well, how do you make it costly? Sanctions. Boycott. Divestment. You may have heard the acronym before, BDS. That is how you make it costly. Now, the thing is, I think sanctions are clear. We know what sanctions are, okay? We've seen, you know, the West, led by America, impose sanctions on every country they don't like, right? So we know what sanctions are like. It, it, actually, it, actually, it actually strangles the country economically and diplomatically. Um, the investment, again, is, 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 is quite clear. I think there's an, a misunderstanding about the boycott. I think that people think, and it's not wrong, but they think that the boycott means don't buy Israeli avocados or oranges or something, and it's, you shouldn't. But boycott means that Israeli teams are prohibited from participating in the Olympics, yeah. which means there should be no presence for Israelis in any arenas. If you held an event 
and you invited a South African team during apartheid, you would be penalized as an organization. Whether again, it's a sporting event, academic event, cultural event, on and on and on. Certainly diplomatic uh, arenas, there should be no representation. It should be absolutely, uh, there should be absolutely no tolerance for that. You know, and I'll, you know, some of you may remember, I always mention this because I think it's important. In the 2021 Olympics in Japan, there was a, an Algerian athlete by the name of Fakhe Marin. And he was a competitor in judo. And he was a young man, I don't know, 20, 22. And you know, he, you know how hard somebody has to work before they can enter the Olympics. You have to be incredibly you know, disciplined and work very hard for many years. And during the Olympics, he was called on to, uh, to compete against a member of the Israeli team. And he said no. He wouldn't do it. He was thrown out of the Olympics. He was thrown out of the International Judo Federation, which means he cannot participate in judo competition anywhere. Anywhere. He ended his career. He sacrificed his career to do the right thing. And personally, as somebody who has experience in martial arts, he won the match without even stepping on the mat. There's no question that he won that match. But he should not have to make that sacrifice. The International Olympic Committee should not allow an Israeli team into the Olympics to begin with. It shouldn't be up to a young person, a young athlete, to sacrifice a career. And this is true, you know, on, in, in every arena. We, see, we hear stories like this, you know, refusal to engage with an Israeli delegation, with an Israeli team, which is wonderful, it's heroic, it's the way it should be. But it's not up to individuals to make the sacrifice. Institutions need to make the sacrifice. That's where the boycott is important. That's what we must demand. And again, I'll say, uh, sporting events, cultural events, diplomatic events, academic arenas, for sure, there should be no, they should not be allowed to enter. You know, in the US, and I'm sure it's the same here on campuses, you've got the, whatever the mascot is, blah, 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 for Israel. And I'm thinking, are you out of your minds? You're allowing a group that promotes racism and violence to have representation on campus? And then the administrations always give a hard time to the pro-Palestinian groups who call for justice and freedom. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what point God is. And when we get serious about Israel paying, that's how you make them costly. That's how you make them pay a price. That's the price they need to pay. And when you do that, that's what brings them to their knees. And then we can make about, bring about change. That's what needs to happen. You know, I think that one of the stories was, uh, the famous story that the, um, I think it was in New Zealand, they had to, they were, they were not allowed to participate in, in, uh, in rugby or something with the South Africans. And that tore us in New Zealand apart, politically. But that was the decision that had to be made. You cannot make any, any compromise on this because they have to be a price. And in the end, like I said before, this is what's going to be beneficial for Palestinians and for Israelis. Because that's the way to peace. That's the only way to peace. So that's how you make it costly. Um, you know, I don't know the, I, uh, the, the, the question about the, uh, the young uh, anti-Zionist Jews. Anti-Zionist Jews have been around for a very long time, and they've been speaking out for a very long time. Nobody's been listening. Now, with these very active young uh, Jewish organizations that have been around and have been protesting, you know, people are paying attention. But it's not really new, and I don't think it's generation. There are many older anti-Zionist Jews around in the U.S. and everywhere else. But I don't think they've been given the, the platform, and I don't think they know how to use the platform as well as these young people. So that's what we're seeing. Um, I'm not sure that this is somehow a departure from a, a generational thing, because I know many, many older anti-Zionist Jews that have been active for a very long time. Many of them are you know, the most observant uh, Orthodox Jews in the world that live in the United States. They are the most, the most you know, consistent anti-Zionists in the world, actually. They've been anti-Zionists from the very, very beginning. And so it's, it's great that people are paying attention, but I don't think it's easier for them or anything like that. I just think that they know how to use the, you know, the platforms that are available to make their voices heard.
present very good arguments uh, about uh, the whole racist nature of the Israeli education system, uh, which basically objectifies and puts forth Palestinians as the enemy other. And we can see this, what is happening in Gaza right now, and uh, which is a genocidal war, clearly. Uh, now, uh, I, I, th I think what we've got to do now is to build up a really critical mass. And I've, I was involved in the anti-Vietnam War movement. And I'm feeling right now that this is what is happening throughout the world that the critical mass is, 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 is building up where the Israeli regime is going to be non-acceptable amongst other nations. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Aisha. Um, you mentioned in, uh, around the work you're doing in Washington, Washington, and I guess that's around building political capacity of people, do you know what I mean, to stand up and to, to advocate, advocate for, um, for Palestine on the political um, uh, scene. My question is, how do we keep Palestine in the forefront if we're thinking, you know, we're talking about politicians, and that it isn't um, lost in, you know, in uh, cost of living. So if I think about the Australian, you know, the Australian political scene, people are passionate, but when it comes to getting ready to vote, whether or not that's state or federal, it's around, you know, cost of living, it's around, you know what I mean, the main what's impacting me, what's the government going to give me when we're thinking around tax breaks and all of that sort of stuff. Absolutely, a pleasure. I've seen you here in, in person, so I'm um, welcome to Australia. Uh, I've been in the question, it's, uh, it's quite long, but um, there's been talks, so it's the, into the de details of what you've discussed today. Um, there's been talks on the media around a second ethnic cleansing plan um, for the Gazans into neighboring countries. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And if it's true, to what extent do you think the Palestinian resistance in Gaza played a role in thwarting these plans? Um, on top of that, I just want to ask another question, if I may. Um, why do you think it is a taboo in the West to objectively and analytically discuss the legitimacy of the Palestinian resistance, including the armed struggle against apartheid? And how do you think we can break that taboo?
after the Palestinians have been killed usually, and then everybody goes back home. And that's exactly the problem I was discussing earlier, that the, the void of an actual Palestinian you know, presence that continues this conversation all the time. So I was talking to a young Palestinian who was an intern in the office of one of the senators in Washington, D.C. And he was telling me that they received 300 emails a day from a single Zionist organization called Stand With Us. 300 emails a day, every senator, every member of Congress, probably the press as well. I wouldn't be surprised if they sent it to the diplomatic corps. Every single day, and that's just one of many, 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 many Zionist organizations that operate in the United States. That's how you keep it in the forefront. That's how you do it. Now, the problem is we're not there. We're, we're they're 100 years ahead of us. We're not there. We don't have the presence to do that. It requires presence. It requires training. It requires a strategy. It requires money. You know, I mean, there's no shortage of money out there that could be dedicated to this, but it's just not happened yet. Um, that's what it takes. That's precisely why their story is always, always on the forefront. It doesn't matter what Israel does, what Israel doesn't do, you know, it's always on the forefront. It's IHRA, the new definition of anti-Semitism, is swept like a wildfire. It's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Redefining anti-Semitism. What will they think of next? But it was brilliant. <laughs> There's not a single non, non uh, like governmental and non-governmental organization, not a single university, church, I don't know what, that didn't pass it. Cities and city councils and regional councils. I mean, everybody's passing this nonsense. Because nobody's really sure what the hell's going on, so they say, well, let's pass it because it's safe. There was a case near Washington, D.C., uh, in Maryland, a county called uh, Montgomery County. The county passed a resolution, and, so the, the new, and they do it in secret. They do it in the middle of the night, so there won't be any opposition. So the word got out, and so it was blocked. A few weeks later, we woke up one morning, and we learned that it passed. They met, I don't know, in the middle of the night in a dungeon basement or something, and they passed it. You know, that's how they do it. You know, but they are constantly present and they're constantly pushing their agenda. And they're constantly thinking of new ways to keep it up, uh, up on the forefront. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. There's no other way to do it. So I hope we can, you know, like I said, this initiative that I'm working on in Washington uh, is to do exactly that. I know there's been people working here in, in uh, Australia to, to do that sort of thing. That's how you do it. There's, we're never going to get beyond where we are unless we can do that. Um, the ethnic cleansing of Gaza, and well, I think what the I think what the uh, Palestinian resistance did. Well, I'll start. I'll start with the end of the question. You know, why? How do the how to start legitimizing the Palestinian resistance and discussion about it? Well, we legitimize it by saying it. You know, every interview I've given, and I've given I don't know how many since October seventh, and every lecture I've given, somewhere in the mix, there's always a question about. I'm sorry? <laughs> I never mentioned Hamas. I never mentioned Hamas. Why do I care if these fighters are a member of this party or that party or this group? They're Palestinian fighters. You think that they belong to something like this? They're not armed groups. They're not... Uh, all the different names they use it. These are Palestinian fighters. That's it. I'm not going to get into that conversation. But you can never hold it. You want to condemn somebody? I condemn the brutal violence by Israel for 75 years. Absolutely. You want to condemn them? You want to condemn an oppressed people for resisting? Are you out of your mind? Who condemns an oppressed people for resisting? What is this nonsense? But we have to, you know, we have to take control of the conversation and not let them dictate what we say or don't say. So I think the, the part of the problem is that people are ill-equipped, and it's not to, because of anybody's fault. You know, I do this every day, all day. Not everybody, you know, does that. And so, not you, we're not, not everybody's equipped for this. And, unless, and they have a playbook. So, like I said, a few days ago, I was at a campus in in, in the U.S. and I heard this you know, river to the sea thing. Yesterday I was in Adelaide and I heard the same thing. Boom, like that, in five minutes. It's done. The playbook is everywhere and everybody knows what to ask, what to say, what to condemn, what to not condemn, and on, on, on. And we're like, okay, well how do we say this and how do we deal with that? And it's legitimate, but we need, we need 
guidance and we need an organization and we need a platform that will help us do that. So the way we legitimize talking about it is by talking about it, is by saying it just the way, you know, just the way it is. And it's not easy and it's not comfortable. And if you're working in the workplace, it's dangerous. If you're a teacher, you're going to get threatened. And if you're this and that and the other, there are a lot of risks and you pay a price. But silence is also a price. Silence is also a price. And the price of silence is paid by the Palestinian children who are buried under the rubble. I think it's important to talk about it in a way that, that you know shocks the other side. And when I say these things, by the way, about the Palestinian fighters, the other side is like in shock. They're in shock. There's like the silence and confusion, and that's precisely where they need to be. And by the way, if they're also offended by this, then that's extra credit. That's what I'm <laughs> How to get this conversation into communities that are already weak, and I think that's what you're talking about, in great you know, communities of immigrants, if I'm not mistaken, that's a really difficult one because they're already vulnerable. And for vulnerable communities to get in, involved in something that is this difficult and complicated is a tough call. Now, having said that, I know in the United States it, it is happening, and people are getting involved, and people are speaking, and, and young people are doing it even though the parents don't want them to, and so on. And, um, and uh, you're also right that in many, in many communities, especially if they're South Asian or Arab, then in many cases it's, uh, it's an aqsa. It's the religious thing that draws them in, and it's. It, I mean, I mean, I think it's a fair concern. I, you know, the, in terms of, of, of access to the religious sites and the existence of the religious Muslim sites and Christian, for that matter, in the Holy Land in Palestine, they are under threat. There's no question. The Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron has already half of it's been taken, and settlers come and go, and some of their soldiers come and go into the Muslim part of it freely whenever they want. Palestinians sometimes don't even have time to roll up the rugs before they walk in with their boots, with their dirty boots, into the mosque. Al-Aqsa, there's the, what's called the Hebronization of Al-Aqsa. In other words, the same, same process where they allow the settlers more and more into the, into the, into the, uh, into the holy uh, space is exactly, gonna is, is exactly happening now, not to mention other places throughout Palestine. So I mean, this is a serious concern, and I think it's a good thing that people get involved you know, on that issue too. The problem with that is, that it's, um, I don't know how to say this properly, you need to have a political element in that as well. It can't just be the religion. Because the problem is the politics. You know, the problem is that Israel allows itself to do this, and this is a political issue. So, but again, having vulnerable communities to delve into this, I think they're courageous when they do, but I can't blame them when they don't. And again, I've never been in that position of vulnerability, so I can't really tell people what to do or not to do when they're in that position. I think, yeah, please. Sorry. Thank you. Um, that's something that I would like to address. I think a few questions were raised in terms of what is it that we can do and how can we basically um, you know, get Palestine to burst out of the Palestine bubble. And I think they, these are questions that are really important to tackle. Um, uh, but in terms of what actually can do, how can we keep Palestine uh, and that's something that you mentioned uh, as well you, in your answer, Emiko. How can we keep it up front and center? Uh, but just to give kind of pra practical steps that you can do. So the Australian Palestine Advocacy Network, APEN, has set up uh, campaigns for people to actually send letters to their political leaders and uh, MPs. So that's one you know, tangible thing that you could actually do, is that you could send those letters to your politicians and keep sending those letters, keep calling them, keep trying to kind of um, and, you know, request that you meet um, and keep up the pressure. So there are actually actions uh, that you could do, something that has been set up by, um, you know, organizations, uh, advocacy organizations. So check out APAN's website. Um, the other thing that I want to address, and that's the question I think that was raised over there in terms of how can we, uh, but also building on Miko's answer, how can we get Palestine to get out of the bubble? Um, that is limited to Palestine and get as many other groups as possible involved. And I think intersectionality is a key. Um, we know that you know settler colonial projects and oppressive regimes support each other. We know that for a fact. 
Um, but we also know that the answer to counter that, um, and that's something that we've been doing successfully to a certain extent, but also obviously there's continuous work that needs to be done in that space. And the answer to counter that is to build a cross-national uh, or international solidarity movement, um, such as you know, the, the global movement for um, justice for Palestine that we're seeing, and that you know, in the last couple of months we've seen the enormous numbers, um, you know, millions and millions around the world coming out. And every, every weekend in our rallies we have such a diverse crowd. Right? We're having, um, uh, so looking at the crowd, like it's, it's uh, people from different backgrounds. Uh, we have different, different flags as well raised to kind of um, highlight the, 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 the diversity of, of um, the, the supporters. So I think it's happening. Uh, we just need to kind of keep pushing in that direction. It's really important to keep finding those links. And, and Nico mentioned one of them is you know, the, the Islamic kind of um, link to the, to the cause. And clearly, that's one important um, link or uh, intersection. But there's also heaps of other intersections that we can uh, build on, and we should continue to build on and extend and expand those networks. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah. So one more round. Um, last three questions, and then that's it. Um, just realizing that we're quite grossly over time. Thank you, Nico. Uh, my name is Rami. I'm from uh, Palestine, from Jinin Camp. Actually, I have uh, two quick questions. The first one is that uh, you have talked about the dismantling of the uh, apartheid regime system, the Israeli apartheid regime system. To what extent do you, do you agree that the Palestinians in Israel should stop participating in the Knesset election? That's my first question. My second is, um, um, you may hear about um, the uh, barbaric attack on Jenin camp right now. About 11 people have been killed until this afternoon. So do you think that Benjamin Netanyahu are trying to turn his focus to West Bank as he's stuck in, in Gaza? That's my question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Nico. Um, I have a number of questions, but I'll just ask the main one that applies to us here. Uh, you, as a Jew, a, an anti-Zionist Jew, you can say these things without being accused of being anti-Semitic. But as an Arab, uh, it's not as easy. And I have come across a lot of the, uh, the you know, what you've ex um, discussed, uh, where I felt like this is really frustrating. Uh, even the language, even describing the situation, I, I have to fight the monopoly over language. I cannot say genocide without, oh, you can't use this word. I can't say. Uh, you know, like anything that uh, remotely expresses what's actually happening, we can't use because we might alienate the community and we're trying to build um, support from the Jewish community. And so I've had, like, I've recently had to deal with, um, you can't say that, uh, let's not use that Term. So, what would you suggest? Do we confront or do we water it down to gain support? And I mean, I don't like it. I'm sure, just one last thing, short of having 12 million home visits, how do we actually impact the uh, Jewish community in Israel to convert them to anti Zionist Jews? Because yeah, it's not going to work otherwise. So I'm just going to ask you a question about the upholding genocide happening now in Gaza. We have seen a lot of investigative reports reflecting on the economic motives behind the genocide to load Gaza down to create a water canal to replace um, the Suez Canal. 
But do you think that the Zionist ideological motive kind of prevails, or the economic motive here, or are they the same, or is it the economic motive that kind of prevails in this genocide? Thank you. basically around um, October 7 um, and Israel's reaction. Um, I will, I've been involved in Palestine solidarity stuff for 55 years. I always, <laughs> always found it very difficult, obviously, because you'd come across people like that you work with, supported Tibet, supported uh, the South African black struggle, even the American Indians, and you would. Uh, uh, one night at work, I was talking to a friend about Palestine, and say this person that supported all those things came in and said, I won't support Palestinians because they're too violent. And of course, I said, Go away and look at the history, you will see that they used all sorts of, you know, struggle for their struggle. And uh, it's always been a problem this exceptionalism with Israel, the exceptionalism of the Palestinians. I found that it's evaporated recently, and I reckon it's a similar thing to what happened in the Vietnam War. The Americans ar arrogantly went in, thought they'd take a few weeks, and, I, and there was this television war that showed all these massacres, four, four million Vietnamese dead, and the Americans lost the war. Um, do you think, a few friends of mine have said that they thought that Netanyahu knew that October 7 was going to happen. He let it happen because it helped him. I, I said, look, I, I say that could have been the reason, but I reckon it's stupidity and arrogance, the same sort of thing that happened in Vietnam. What, what do you think? about the ongoing ethnic cleansing. They're there to talk about all the permits that we're not allowed to have 
and all the houses that are being demolished that people, really people don't know that this is happening because Israel is, you know, it's great at kind of hiding those facts. So I think it's a fair question and that's something that we're constantly reevaluating. Every election we're like, well, what do we do now? Do we participate or do we not participate? But I think given recently and how um, the shift in, <laughs> which is quite actually embarrassing, um, the shift uh, with regards to how the, the political, um, you know, some of the political parties have been um, and uh, their attempt to kind of integrate, uh, such as, you know, Montserrat uh, Abbas. We're not related, to the same names, by the way. Um, <laughs> Yes, I know your point. It's the fig leaf, right? Isn't it? So yeah, this is what they are talking about as this as a as a yeah. apartheid system. They claim that we have Palestinians yes. participating in the electoral process. process. But this is a very superficial understanding of what democracy is, isn't it? Like if you claim that a, 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 there was also elections in Egypt, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I think the fact that you have elections does not necessarily mean that you have democracy and that's what we need to tackle but I think that the political and look this is a role that political parties could potentially also play outside of the Knesset right in terms of that awareness raising and pushing that narrative that is the indigenous Palestinian population but just to answer that question so I, I don't know if we have a straightforward answer to that I think it's something that we're constantly evaluating sorry this is an unfair <laughs> No, I think I think you're in a much better position to answer that question than I am. Sorry, we, we covered all the questions. I think now sure. Nico's going to address his. Pretty sure it is. Yeah. I think I, I think you're much better equipped to answer that question than I am. That's for sure. Um, so I appreciate that. I'll say I'll say two things about that uh, from my experience. One is I don't know how they can operate in that. I've been to the Knesset several times, mostly to visit Palestinian members. Um, and it's, it's the most racist, disgusting place I can even imagine. Uh, but I do, th and, 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 and it's, it's not a straight, there's no way to answer that question, you know, clearly, yes or no, because there's too many elements. I think the reality is that more, most Palestinian citizens of Israel actually do boycott and don't vote. Um, but when I see Ahmad Tibi, um, or in the past, he was speaking Arabic from the podium, and I see the reactions, from the other the, the Israeli going nuts. I think it's worth it just for that. He <laughs> <laughs> reminds, reminds them, as they should be reminded, even if they're not really listening, he reminds everybody, and you know, this goes on TV and this goes on social media, that this is Palestine. Yes. And he stands there with his big Israeli flag and song and reminds them, this is Palestine, this is his country, this is his language. And they can't, and there's nothing they can do to change that. And when Hein Zabi was in the Constitution, he drove him crazy and keep reminding them that. So I think there's value in that, but again, I'm not the one that really has the ability uh, to, to, to make that judgment. I think Palestinian citizens of Israel, Israel need to make that judgment. Um, as for Janine, I mean, Israel has been fighting, uh, has been scared to death of Janine for a very long time. Uh, so, all I can say is that we've seen just incredible heroism coming out of Janine for years now. I have a good friend who's a cartoonist from Janine. His name is Mohamed Sabani, and he does incredible work. And he's a good friend, um, and I love his stuff. And his some of his some of his cartoons represent that that heroism from Janine better than anybody else I've seen. But the thing is, because he's from there. Um, so, but again, I think Israel has been terrified in attacking Janine. Um, for a very long time, so that's just the reality because Janine is a, is a hub of, of great courage. Um, let's see, our guest has a number. So the second question, whether to confront or water down. I mean, you've heard my talk, I think, right? <laughs> so I don't know that, I don't, I don't think there's any question about where I stand on this issue. And again, I am not, I'm not the one who has to suffer the consequences. Like, like the things that you described. However, it's, you know, like I said, silence is a price. And the price of that silence is paid by, you know, the Palestinian being killed. So it's a very tough choice. But, uh, as again, a good 
a good, good, good brother, friend of mine, uh, Bessie Tamimi, says, you know, we expect to pay a price because we stand and resist. And we expect to pay a price. And we expect that our children will pay a price. And his daughter is Ahat Tamimi, she's paid a price. And all these kids have paid a price um, as a result of that. So it's a decision that it needs to be made, whether you confront it. And I think it's important to confront it also because how else are, going, are they going to know? You know, how else are they going to know that this is racist, that this is wrong? My mother used to say, if you don't tell a fool that they're a fool, they're never going to know. <laughs> Sometimes it's, 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 you know, you do pay a price, but I mean, we expect to pay a price when we stand up for something important. Um, ah, yeah. So one of the stories that came out, and even by serious journalists like Seymour Hirsch uh, in, in Washington D.C. and others, that somehow the Israelis knew about October 7th, but they let it happen. And it caught on. And I'm thinking, once again, it's part of this incredibly stupid racist perspective that says that if Palestinians were able to do something successfully, Israel had to be pulling the strings. There's no way Palestinians were able to outsmart, outmaneuver, outstrategize, and defeat Israel because they are, you know, intelligent and, and know how to plan and know how to fight and they are courageous and smart enough to do what needs to be done. And I think that's part of that. So I reject that, uh, that idea. And I actually called Seymour Hirsch. I actually called Seymour, I don't know if you know who he was, he was back in the day, he was a brilliant, uh, very important journalist. Uh, and I, I called him and said, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? He said, no, 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 I have a source. I have an Israeli intelligence officer who's a source. Well, of course! <laughs> so I don't buy that. And it's, it's like another claim that Israel, uh, Israel created Hamas, because if there's a solid, brave, you know, uh, resistance organization, then Israel must have created it. Well, Israel did not create Hamas, okay? If, uh, you know what I mean? If anybody takes the time to study it, and I have, and I mentioned it in my second book, Injustice, I mentioned Hamas a great deal, um, uh, then that's also nonsense. But again, this idea, it falls on, you know, very firm ground because there's already this, you know, this, this preconceived idea that Palestinians are incapable. So if they did something and they were successful, Israel must have helped them somehow. So I, I reject that. I don't believe it's true for one second. I think it's nonsense. Um, and like I said, you can probably hear my voice about to disappear. So I just want to say thank you again uh, for being here. I want to thank my friend Nasser Mashi.